I recently finished Omori, putting me into a total state of mental anguish and depression, so of course that got me thinking about JRPGs. If you ask me my favorite game genres, I think RPGs would be in my top 5. Except I only like about 6 of them and looking at this lineup is strong evidence I might be gay. For me, if I get into one of these titles, it'll envelop my life. But to get there, I've gotta get invested in the first couple hours at least. I've been noticing recently that it's not the overarching battle mechanics or the story that grabs me and makes me keep playing. In fact, it's often the subtle polishes that give me the motivation to spend the next 80 hours of my life with a game. So here's some green flags for dating JRPGs. Obtaining skills. Skills, arts, magic, PSI, crafts, whatever you want to call it in any specific game is everyone's favorite thing about combat, right? Like there's no one who's like, you know what I love? The guard command. Skills are always the most unique part about any RPG character, giving them their identity and their role in battle. But a thing that can concern me is that if you can only get skills leveling up. Now, it is fun to wait on the level up screen hoping that extra line of text pops up, yet at the same time it's boring, because you essentially did nothing to achieve the skill. You might level up after defeating a tough boss, or when grinding. Not really satisfying. So when I was playing Omori and I learned headbutt through a quick side quest, I got really excited. Skills in this game can be obtained in a multitude of ways. Interacting with certain people, picking up pieces of equipment, completing story segments, and of course, leveling up. To be fair, there's not that many skills you can get from these alternative methods, but it was a pleasant surprise that made me interact with the game just a little bit more. I found myself more willing to do side quests and to go out of my way to find secrets, just on the off chance I might find another skill. Hell, the biggest area in the game, Orange Oasis, is completely optional, and I explored the entire thing. For my troubles, I got to fight JPEGs of real animals, fight the gods of bread, and most relevant to the topic at hand, I got the skill spicy food from talking to a man on fire. The rewards are worth it because its content cannot be obtained anywhere else. It's these little things that really matter to me. Cool equipment. You know what's boring in RPGs? Getting equipment that's worse than what you already have. You know what's also boring in RPGs? Getting equipment that only has better stats than what you have. I like raising my stats over the course of the game, it's one of the reasons I dabble in the genre, but that idea doesn't have to control equipable items. When you find a helmet that gives you 10 more defense than your previous one, there is literally no reason not to use it. It presents no interesting choice for the player other than if they can afford or find the item. And once you do put it on, you'll keep it on until you find the next piece of armor that upgrades your stats. Enter Final Fantasy IX, which probably holds the title for the best equipment in any RPG. Gear pieces offer elemental resistances, boosts to specific attacks, nullifications, stats in multiple areas, like some armors granting more magic, but the main attraction is the equipment's relationship with abilities. Every equipable item's got a skill linked to it. When wearing that item, the user gains access to that particular ability until they gain enough ability points through winning battles to permanently learn it. This system has you constantly changing gear. Boss does a certain type of damage? Change armors. Need to learn a key ability? Grab a new weapon. I highly doubt you can spend more than 30 minutes with any given gear piece in this game, no matter how beefy their stats may be. It is insane how much customization and excitement comes from a part of RPGs that many games simply do the bare minimum for. They are nice to wait sta- Smaller numbers. I started playing Trails of Cold Steel because I wanted to play another RPG after Omori and people seemed to be singing its praises. So I boot up the game and after being hit with quite possibly the worst anime trope, you know, the one where the girl falls on top of the guy, calls him a pervert and slaps him, I looked at my level 1 stats, and God! 
Am I alone in this? Like, okay, you're telling me both this cat with wings and a fresh high school student can take about the same amount of sword slashes to the face, and this number is quantified by the number 500? Bigger numbers make character progression a lot harder for me to visualize. Look, man, I already take and deal hundreds of damage at base. What more could you possibly expect from me? It makes me feel unnaturally powerful, especially in the beginning of the game where I'm supposed to be at the start of my journey. Compare this to Earthbound. You start off fighting dogs and birds, dealing two or four damage apiece. Then you fight Frank, who sticks out because not only does he stab children, but he's the first enemy who will start dealing upwards of 20 damage to you. Mondo Mole feels dangerous because he tears into you for 50 damage. Once you reach Trillionage Sprout, you'll be blasting off PK fires of 200 damage. And when you shoot a multi-bottle rocket that does 1400 damage, it feels impressive because the floor you start off on was so low. By having the numbers evolve alongside your journey, you feel monstrously powerful by the end of Earthbound. Basically, what I'm trying to say is smaller is better, right? I mean, big just gets in the way, and it's all- You know, after listing all these points, I'm really not sure this is the genre for me. Hey guys, don't assume I'm back. Wait till I actually upload two videos in the same month.